Well, good evening, fellows. I appreciate uh, you all being here. Um, Ty asked me, I don't know how long ago, if I'd be willing to speak, and I said, well, you know, let me pray about it. And so I prayed and prayed, and I kept waiting for God to tell me no, and he wouldn't. So I said, okay, Ty, I can. I can. So, so this is my trial run, so if you, if you don't like it, tell him, never have me do it again. If you do like it, we can, I'm sure he'll, he might ask me back. So, uh, But tonight we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to start a new topic tonight. Once I get my machine open here. All right, first off, I'm going to ask you guys a question. I want to ask a question, don't yell out an answer. Kind of just think about the question. Um, and then just, we'll talk about it in a minute. So if I ask you to picture a sword, or a sword, as I would like to say, in your head, what do you, what do you think of? All right, what's that picture that comes to your mind when someone says, all right, just sword? All right, so just think about that for a minute. Well, that could be a sword, as long as it's got a bayonet on the end, right? All right so what did, you, what did you see? I mean, did you, did you see Conan the Barbarian's sword? Did you see Mel Gibson's sword from Braveheart? No. Nope, a two-handed broad sword that maybe a medieval knight would have, would have wielded. Calvary sword, that was the next one on the Calvary, or maybe a Japanese katana. I like Japanese katanas, I'm kind of a fan of those. Or did you see a fantasy sword? You know, if you play role-playing games, did you see a fantasy sword that one of your favorite role-playing people might wield, right? That's, you know, that no one's ever seen before. Or maybe a lightsaber, if you're a Star Wars fan, did you see a lightsaber like Luke's, Luke Skywalker would use? Or maybe if you're really Christian and you're really religious and you're really filled up, you would say, nope, I thought of a Roman short sword because we're talking about, we're talking about, uh, you know, Christian stuff. Or as Brandon points out, the, the sword of the, <clears throat> of the truth, right? So if you thought of the gladius, that's all good for you. But for each of that, each of that's going to be a different picture, right? It depends on what you grew up with, what you like, what your background is, what kind of history you like, you know, what's your thing? You know, it could be an AR, right? If that's, you know, maybe you're like, I don't want a sword, I want bullets, right? Because I can't whack away bullets with a sword, but I can whack away swords with a bullet. So that's what it really was going to be, right? But you're thinking, why did we start this with, with swords? Brandon kind of broke the ice, already told you we're going to talk about swords. But if you're a fan of forged and fire, like I am, I'm not going to ask you, you know, to forge your signature blade and your signature style in the next three hours, and then we'll have a panel of judges test them. We're not going to do that. Um, if you don't know what that is, come talk to me later, and I'll tell you all about the forged and fire. It's a great, great show. One of my, one of my all-time favorites. All right. But we're going to start a new section tonight, and it's called, as you might expect, The Sword. And it's about conf confrontation. And we're going to cover a, a few different topics tonight on that. But um, if you remember, all the way back to the beginning of the series, we started talking about self-mastery. That was the first part we talked about. We spent some time on leadership and quite a bit of time on leadership. Um, Mark talked to us a few times on that, so that was really good. A couple weeks ago, Terry talked to us about communications. And, and then last week, Ty led us through empathy and getting back to center. So I might weave a few of those pieces in there because the truth by itself really can be just a... a a blob, right? I mean, unless you can communicate it, unless you can have some sort of your own self-mastery, you're really not going to be able to use the truth, right? So there's a lot, a lot to unpack, so let's get started. So there's several topics in this, in this uh, section of the book, and we're going to talk about four of them. First is Jesus is a man of courage. Jesus is a man of endurance is the second one. Jesus is a man of confront, confrontation. That's a hard word for me to say. But we're going to spend the bulk of the time tonight talking about Jesus is a man of truth. And for us, well, we're going to talk about some, some facts on how you can wield the truth, right, and wield the truth in a way that, that brings value to the, to the conversation. All right. So the author starts the section off by talking about Jesus as a revolutionary. And he was, and he still is. Right? And the people of Jesus' time were looking for a Messiah, a warring Messiah who's going to come deliver them. And they were thinking about deliverance from the physical, right? They were thinking about delivering from, being, being delivered from Rome. And so he didn't come as they expected. But he did come to deliver, right? Jesus came, came to deliver and to wage war. But really he came to do it in the spiritual realm, realm right? One of Jesus' names is Prince of Peace. And if you look at John's gospel in John 14, 27, it says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. So Jesus' mission was to bring peace between God and man, right? If you remember back in the, you know, when the angels came, you know, you know, 
God has brought, you know, brought Jesus to, to man to bring peace to us. All right, so for those folks who accept that Jesus is come to bring peace with repentance, there's going to be peace. But if you don't, no peace, right? Jesus was pretty clear. In Matthew 10, 34 through 36, it says, Do not think that I've come to bring, come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be of his own, those of his own household. And really, that's really talking about, you know, if you give your life to Christ, I mean, if you think of other religions, like you know, my son and daughter-in-law work with, with, with Muslims in, in uh, Turkey. If, a, if one of those people comes, comes to Christ, they're cut off from their family, right? They're, they're at war with their family. They have now betrayed the entire family by becoming a Christian, unless the whole family, you know, gets turned to Christ. But, you know, so that's what Jesus is talking about. If, when you become a Christian, there's, there's some enmity there, right, between, between yourself and the world. And if your family's in the world, there's going to be some enmity. You, you may not be able to, um, you know, have, you may not have fist fights at Thanksgiving. Maybe you did. If you did, we'll talk about that later. But, um, you know, there's going to be some en enmity. So that's, you know, Jesus is telling us that. He's telling us he's going to lead us into battle with the world and with its systems. And he warned his disciples and us through the, through the, the word in John 15, 18 through 19, it says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of this world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So up front, we're told the cost, right? We're told it's gonna be rejection, suffering, conflict. But the important thing we gotta remember out of all this is our battle's not against people. As the Apostle Paul, one of my favorites, in Ephesians 6.12 puts it, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in, in heavenly places. If you've hung around Mark Stoddard for any length of time, you'll hear him say, our mission field is people, right? It's, you know, so that's where we gotta make sure that we're, we're dealing with people. People aren't the enemy. What they do may, may be enemies to God, but they are not the enemy. So we can't hold people you know, in that, that regard. So for, for you and I, as Ephesians 6, 17 would say, let's take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we're gonna start off with Jesus is a man of courage after I get a drink. So the author starts by talking about this section, and talking this, this section, talking about Jesus healing the man with the deformed hand on the Sabbath. So if you remember in Luke 6, 6 through 11, we find that it says, on, the, on another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts and he said to, them, said to the man with the withered hand, come and stand here. And he rose and he stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them all, he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But those around were filled with fury and disgust with one another what they might do. You know, so we think about that, you know, it makes sense to us that we'd want to do good and not do evil on the, on the Sabbath. But, you know, that, that amount of, of, of uh, courage to, to stand there in the midst of all those folks and say, look, here's what we're going to do. You know, we're going to do the right thing. We're going to heal. On that. You know, so for Jesus to do that, I mean, he didn't back down from the mighty work he was called to do. And he didn't let those try to intimidate him with their opinions, their self-righteousness, their religiousness, or, their, or accusations stand in the way. So we have to remember that Jesus is a man of courage. Jesus is also a man of endurance. If you look at what he, what he went through from the time he left the upper room until his death on the cross, the level of spiritual and physical endurance, I mean, it's just amazing. Prayed for hours in the garden. He was so stressed, so anxious, so overcome uh, that he asked his father to remove the cup from him. But then he subjugated his, his human will to the will of the father. He was so stressed that his sweat becomes his droplets of blood. And I've heard a lot of people talk about, you know, well, that just means he had big drops of sweat but it's, it's a really, it's a real and it's a rare condition known as hematidrosis. If you're a medical person and I said that wrong, 
we'll talk, we can talk about that later. But it's called hematidrosis, and that's where one sweat will contain blood. So it's a true, real condition, and Jesus suffered it, right? Medical science shows that the sweat glands are surrounded by tiny blood vessels. These can constrict and then dilate to the point of rupture, causing blood to effuse into the sweat glands. What's the cause? Extreme anguish. anguish. So, I mean, Jesus was in extreme anguish as he was up in the garden praying. I mean, in his human will, he did not want to be, he did not want to be crucified. Who, who wants to be killed? I don't. I mean, that's not, I didn't wake up this morning and say, hey, I'm looking for a way to get killed. Can someone help me out? All right. And then the next, the scourging that, he, that Jesus endured would have killed many men. And if you look at some history, historians tell us that death was often the result of this cruel form of punishment. Though if you were being crucified, it was necessary to keep the criminal, criminal alive so they could be brought to public subjugation on the cross. But they beat you enough that you were near death so you wouldn't stay on the cross too long, especially if it was on a, in, in Israel, if it was on a, on a Friday, so you wouldn't be, be on the cross alive after, after sundown. Right. So think about that. Many people would have died just from the, scour- the scourging. Have you ever seen, um, what was the Mel Gibson movie? The pa- right. I mean, if you think about that, I mean, that was a, that was a pretty realistic, I think, account of, of the, scour- the scourging that, that he took. Right? So Jesus is certainly a man of endurance. Jesus is a man of conf- confrontation. Matthew 22, 15 through 22 tells us, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. <clears throat> then he said to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled and they left him and went away. So Jesus had no problem being confrontational, right? Now, we've got to remember he's God. He's always right. And he always confronts with the love of the father to correct and restore. Right? It's never just confrontation for confront- confrontation sake. So we've got, we got to remember to not lose sight of that. But as you read through the Gospels, notice that Jesus doesn't shy away from confronting the religious leaders on their own hypocrisy. So that's important too, right? If you continue to read and dig just a bit deeper, Jesus confronted injustices and stood up for weak and the marginalized, who were oftentimes victimized by those same religious leaders that were there to shepherd and support them. And as men of God, that's one of our callings, right? We're called to do the same, to stand up, confront injustice, and defend the defenseless. So... So Jesus is a man of confrontation. Lastly, we're going to talk about Jesus is a man of truth. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we know Jesus is the truth. He never denied his identity. At his trial before the Sanhedrin as well as before Pilate, he never, did, never denied who he was. He affirmed that he was the Messiah. In fact, John 18, 38, 37, 38 re- relates this. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king? For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Then Pilate said to him, what is truth? So hear that last little part again. Pilate said to him, what is truth? So let that settle on you just for a minute. What is truth? And then picture the, picture the scene, right? So here's Pilate, the most powerful man in the region, in the natural, standing before the Son of God, the Son of Man, the great I Am, the Almighty God, wrapped in f- the frailty of human skin. And he's asking him in complete and utter darkness, what, what is truth? Can you imagine that? I, I can't. But for, for us, fortunately, we have you know, 2,000 years of Christianity, we have the, the goodness of the Holy Spirit's revelation to us, so we know that Jesus is the truth. But think about today's culture, how today's culture is like that. Think of all the media accounts, all the talking heads you've heard, all the people that you know, or people that you've been in contact with, maybe even in your own family, that may have said, what is truth? Or, this is my truth. Or, you can't tell me what my truth should be. 
right? Or even more, how many in this room, you don't have to raise your hand, who have been here in darkness at some point in their life and not known the truth or not wanted to recognize the truth, right? Maybe you might have known the truth, but you didn't want to recognize it. I, for one, most certainly, oh my goodness, I certainly have been, right? And I praise Jesus every day that I was blessed enough to have been lovingly restored to the way, the truth, and the life, All right? So we, we, we could all be there, right? But, I mean, the old saying, therefore, but the grace of God, they're, they're glad, but for the grace of God, right? So, I mean, we are, I, I know for me, I'm very blessed that, um, to, to have that done. Right? And again, as the Apostle Paul, you'll, you'll find he's probably my favorite, so eloquently put it in Romans 1, 24 through 25, therefore God gave them up to, in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Right? So what is truth? Let's unpack that just a little bit. Right? So John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. I mean, it's like Bible 1, ABC, right? So if we extend that, the logic the argument logically, because I like to do, I like to be logical. And if you ever listen to Terry Ingalls talk, he'll tell you, you prove scripture with scripture, right? You don't just take a, take a you know, pluck a piece of scripture out of the air and go, hey, this is what it says and march on, right? You got to prove scripture with scripture, right? So if we extend the argument logically, if Jesus is the truth and Jesus is the word, then the word must be the truth. Seems pretty simple to me, right? So the gospel of Jesus Christ is the truth. There's no question about that. Again, Paul, my favorite, tells us in Tim, tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all, and I, this is from the Amplified because I like the way it, uh, it, it does this particular scripture. All scripture is God-breathed, given by divine inspiration, and it's profitable for instruction, for conviction of sin, for correction of error and restoration to obedience, for training in righteousness, learning to live in conformity to God's will, both publicly and privately, behaving honorably with personal integrity and moral courage so that the man of God, that's us, may be complete and proficient, outfitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Right. And again, in Romans 1.16, he says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So now we know what the truth is. But, and here's a very big but, so we'll go there. Um, the truth can be offensive, right? And we've already seen that Jesus spoke the truth without regard for the feelings of his hearers. If you remember the little story from Luke eleven forty two and 45, Jesus said, but woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves and people walk over them without knowing it. Then one of the lawyers answered him, teacher, in saying these things, you also insult us. Okay. You know, and Jesus like, if the shoe fits, wear it. Or the sandal in this case, right? So does that, without regard to the feelings of our hearers? You can, but that's not where we should be, right? I'm going to say no, and here's the reason. Right, Jesus is God. He created all of us, every one of us. He created every person that he interacted with when he was here on earth. And as we've already established, being God, he's always right. And he always confronts with the love of the Father to correct and restore, not just, not just for confrontation's sake, right? He wasn't, he wasn't telling the Pharisees just to make them mad or just to make them th you know, feel poorly that they were like unmarked graves, right? He was telling them that to try to restore them so they would come to their senses and come to Christ, right? <clears throat> so that was his underlying objective, right? He had no ulterior motive. He was trying to correct and restore can we say the same? Obviously, I didn't create anybody. Well, I, mean, I do have a couple of kids, so. But I didn't really create them, right? I was God's conduit for that, right? So we didn't create anybody. But when you go to talk to somebody in truth, do you, do you have an underlying motive or objective as you prepare to bludgeon somebody with the truth? Right? And I'd say bludgeon because a lot of times people, right, the truth, speaking the truth in love, it's really sometimes people's, their truth in their love, right? They're not necessarily loving the person that they're speaking to. They love themselves more. They love to be right more than they love to give the truth. All right. Um, so do we seek to, to lord our holiness and righteousness over them? Or are we truly seeking to set someone free from bondage? So it's really, it really comes out to a matter of the heart, right? 
Got to do a heart check. We need to check our motive. You know, we need the Holy Spirit's guidance, right? And that's really where the guidance needs to be, is right. It's not, you know, ask the, before you speak in truth, make sure you're prayed up. You're right. You're in this in the right motive, right? Um, so we need the Holy Spirit's guidance, uh, Holy Spirit, to check our heart and our intentions. Um, because as the other book put it, when the when the truth is shared from a relationship with pure intentions, and that intention is to set someone free that correction may save that someone from, from massive damage, right? So we have the ability to, to, you know, with God's grace and God's honoring God to pull someone back from the, from the fire, right? I mean, you know, they talk about it several times in the scripture, you know, if you, if you bring someone back from the fire, that's what we should be doing, right? So I'm going to give you three examples of what we're talking about. And uh, they're going to be a little bit all over the map, but, uh, you know, I'll try to try, tie them all together when we're done, right? So as some of you may already know, Rocky is one of Pastor Ty's favorite, if not his favorite movie. Um, and we're going we're gonna to talk about a scene from that cinematic classic, because it is a cinematic classic. So if you remember, right, Rocky's getting beaten to a pulp by Apollo Creed. This is the first one, because to me, that's the only decent Rocky movie. The rest kind of went off the, off the cliff. Sorry, Ty, but that's my own personal view. Um, so that's not a paid announcement. So he's getting beat to a pulp by, by Apollo Creed. His eyes are swollen. He can barely see. But the truth is, he's got more in him, right? He's got more fight in him. He's not ready to give up, but he can't see. I mean, he can't see what he's got. He's been blinded by the battering and the beating, right? So in the corner, who's the, who's the cut man? And everybody else, Mick, right? So, so Mick can help him. So what does he say? One of, I mean, and there's a thousand classic lines, iconic lines from Rocky. But, but as only Stallone could utter, he says, cut me, Mick, right? That's, I mean, that's what he says. And Mick pulls out his sword of truth, which is a razor blade in this particular instance, and he cuts through the darkness of those swollen eyelids so Rocky can see. And if you've not seen Rocky, I'm going to give a spoiler alert, so cover your ears. Rocky fights on and wins, right? So, you know, so, th so for us, what's that look like? Right? We're not probably going to be the cut man in the corner of a, of a well, some of you might. Um, I guess Dan's not here, so, but Dan might be a cut man at some point, Dan Rawls with his <clears throat> son, but... So for us, that looks like, you know, sometimes the world has battered or bruised us or someone, you know, someone that you come across, someone you have some contact with, and maybe a Mick comes along to help you or you get a chance to be the Mick, right? And the fix is the sword of truth, the sword of truth, right? So that, that book, right, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it needs to be wielded gently like a scalpel, you know? I mean, think about if, if Mick had taken, you know, a four foot long katana to cut Rocky's eyelids, uh, fight's over, right? Because now the top of the head's gone, right? So it's got to be wielded gently. And with love and the desire to continue the fight, you cut through that swelling, right, to see the truth. All right, second story. When I was a kid, probably 10 or 12, I smashed the snot out of my finger. I think it was either my middle finger or my ring finger on my right hand. I can't tell you how I did it. I don't remember. I'm sure I was doing something stupid. Um, but I, I mean, it smashed it good. The next day, it was just throbbing. I mean, I could feel every heartbeat in my fingertip. Every, I mean, even just the air going past it made, that, made it hurt. I mean, every, I mean, it was one of those ones where you're, you're nauseous, right? Um, and I, 10 or 12 years old, I was certain my fingertip was going to explode. I, I knew for sure that thing was just going to explode and I was going to lose my finger. It was a huge bl blood blister on the next morning when I woke up. And I thought, man, I'm gonna, either it's going to explode or I'm, it's going to die and rot off. And my dad, you know, and my dad was not the most compassionate of men. Um, he's passed since, but uh, he was not very compassionate. I'm sure he was tired of listening to me whine and whimper. So after breakfast, he says, I can fix it, but you got to let me do it, and you got to be still. And I'm thinking, okay. So, and it wasn't easy because then he pulls out his pocket knife. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, uh, he's going to cut my finger off. So, so we're standing in the kitchen because this is the mid-70s, and if you're my age and you remember the mid-70s, Everything that you did emergency surgery right, was, was in the kitchen. You're in the kitchen. You're getting splinters out. You're getting stitches or whatever in the kitchen because we did everything. So I'm standing in the kitchen, got my, my hand on the counter, shaking, whimpering and whining. And I'm thinking, uh, I, hope my dad did, I'm, I hope dad didn't cut my finger off. All right. So he takes that pocket knife and he slowly begins to drill through the, the top of my finger now. And I, I'd love to tell you it was, it was immediate, but no. I mean, it hurt like heck because he's pushing that pocket knife into my fingernail as he's spinning it around. 
But I, I will never, to the day I die, forget that sense of, of relief when he popped through that dude and that blood blister broke and all that blood and ook squirted it out of that fingernail. So I'll never forget that. But I felt a lot better. My finger felt a lot better. And you're going, okay, what's the purpose? Right? So the lesson for us is that sometimes bringing the truth might be uncomfortable or painful. And it may be messy. Usually it is. I know the times I've been restored to the truth, it was probably messy. But if it's done in love and the person is ready and you use the right tool, right, the sword of truth, and you wield it gently, it'll bring relief. All right? All right, last story, and then we'll wrap up. I love stories. <clears throat> um, so this one in 1944, two young Jewish men were the first Jews to ever escape Auschwitz. Their goal was to tell the world, and more importantly, the remaining European Jews, about the Nazi death camps and the Nazis' agenda for extermination of the Jewish people. These men had the truth. They had unique access in the camp through their jobs that they had in the camp. That <clears throat> They had memorized the logistics of the machine of death. Right? They could tell you without error how many Jews were in each cattle car that came to Auschwitz. They could tell you without error how many cars were in each train and how many trains came each day, each week, each month. They could tell, the, tell you the average percentage of Jews who were ushered immediately to the, to the gas chamber and the crematorium compared to those that stayed in the camp. You know, and they could tell you that even the ones that stayed in the camp, as slave labor, there were most of them were going to die from either overwork, disease, starvation, or, or even the whim of a sadistic guard. Right? I mean, a guard had life and death control over these people. They could make you mad. Stomp you, I mean, stomp you to a pulp, right? But they could also tell you where, where the Jews came from, right, based upon the tattoo that the, the prisoners got, because all, all the tattoos were, were regionalized. So if you were this number starting with like 4044, you were from Czechoslovakia or whatever, whatever. And, and they could tell you in what month you came. I mean, they, they had this stuff in their heads, which is, to me, just amazing. But they could tell you where they came from, and they knew 1944, the only the only large population left was in Romania because the Romanians were the last conquered country to let their Jews be, be exported, right? They knew the truth. And they told the truth. They escaped. They told the truth. And most of their fellow Jews couldn't or wouldn't believe them, right? They, the, the people they, they told to, they either couldn't believe that another group of people could be that sadistic and in, inhumane to do that to a group of people, or they said, well, that may happen to those, but it's not going to happen to us. They won't do that to us. We're not going to get, you know, we're not going to go. So meanwhile, while these two guys were escaping, and they escaped on foot through the mountains from, of Poland from Auschwitz to Czechoslovakia, where they were from, another Jewish man was able to get free. But he was aided by an SS officer. This SS officer had fallen in love with a young Jewish girl in the family camp. And in order to rescue her, his words, he wanted to rescue her, he had to save her mother because she said, I'm not going without my mom. So he said, okay. So he, he arranged to have this man, this other Jewish man, escape in a stolen SS uniform on a stolen SS bicycle, rode right out through the camp. They went back to the Jewish ghetto because they were going to make the arrangements for, after the escape, for the mother to be, be hidden. And so that's what you're doing. So they were returning to Auschwitz after they made the arrangements to complete the plan, and the SS man was caught. Uh-oh. The Jewish man got away. He was, he was able to evade capture because he wasn't on the train when the, when the train stopped. So he went back to his community, and he told every Jew that he could. He said, you got to flee. Resist capture. Raise a ruckus. Do whatever you can. They said, even if you just, you know, be voiceful, at, you know, at the train station, when they, take, when they heard you to the train station, just resist going. Don't, I mean, they said, you know, you, you, you know, do whatever you can to not get on the train willingly. They said, if you get on the train, you'll die. If you fight back or you run or you create an uproar, you may die. But I guarantee you, if you get on the train, you will die. So that's truth. I mean, that's pretty truthful. And it was, and it was factual. I mean, there's not a bit of, of hyperbole in that, right? So truth, spoken boldly, spoken without regard for the hearers, right? He, was, he didn't care if you wanted to hear him or not. If you were a Jew, he was going to tell you, get, 
away from the train. Don't get on the train. Do whatever you can. Run to the woods. Um, whatever. But it was spoken in love, right? It was with the desire to save them from the flames. And it literally, literally flames this time, right? Because they were going to go, they were going to go to the crematorium. So you know what he found out? Just like the other two guys that escaped, nobody was listening. Or at least not as they thought they would. I mean, they thought it would just be this huge uproar. I mean, they wrote a report. It went to the President of the United States. It went to the Prime Minister of, of, of uh, England. And it was kind of poo-pooed. Well, you know, we don't know that that's really happening. But these people, he told personally, he couldn't get him to hear, right? Because the program of deception that the Nazis put in place was so thorough, so thorough, that only his closest friends would believe him. So he, I don't know how many hundreds of people he told, but he said probably only 20 people of all the hundreds that he told fled or resisted to get away from getting on the train, right? So I tell you that last story really because we've got to realize that not everybody is going to believe the truth, right? I mean, not if they did, if everyone was going to believe the truth, this building wouldn't hold us, right? I mean, we would be, we would be overflowing. Um, but just like, and just like Pilate, many people wonder, what is truth? And many more have their own truth, right? You can go to, drive through Bellingham, you find a lot of truths in Bellingham, right? And it doesn't, those truths don't align with the truth, right? And some people have lived in darkness so long and the enemy's program of deception is so thorough that they just can't believe. You know, they, they've lived their life for as long. I mean, my grandmother was 102 when she passed. And she would tell you, and I, and I know in my heart of hearts, she, she was not a saved woman. But she would tell you, I'm a member of that church. She hadn't darkened the door of that church since 1951, probably. But she was still on the rolls. So that program of deception, that she was a good person. She was, you know, she'd been to church. She was, you know, she, there was, you, were, you couldn't convince her. She would not believe the truth. And trust me, many of us tried to tell her the truth. Right? It's not always immediate. It's not always easy. And I'm not saying that God can't or won't just flip a switch in somebody and make them believe the truth overnight. Right? So you're not always going to bring immediate enlightenment to folks. But sometimes our job is just to speak the truth and let the Holy Spirit do the work. Right? It, it, it's his work anyways. It's not our work. We're just here to do what he tells us to do. He's going to do the work. I mean, you can be the most eloquent speaker or you could be like me, not. And my words aren't going to convince somebody. It's, you know, the Holy Spirit's words through me, right? So pick your battles with discernment and with the help of the Holy Spirit. And if God gives you that unique privilege and opportunity to speak the truth into someone's life, do it with love and with your only motive to pull them out of the fire, Okay. That's all I got. Let's have some table talk. I got some questions for us.